Oh, wait, 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 wait. Oh. No, no. We're like, oh. <laughs> All right, um, I'm Elizabeth Barra. Uh, somebody held a gun to my head, a, an invisible, immaterial gun, and told me I was moderating this panel, so I guess I'm moderating this panel. Um, I write uh, science fiction and fantasy, and my qualification for being on the Cyberpunk 101 panel is that my first three novels, uh, the Jenny Casey series, are sort of post-cyberpunk. We don't use the word. We don't use that word? No, oh, I don't. Cyberpunk? Are we in the wrong room? No, I they told me the Cyberpunk room. book was dead and I wrote four novels, so I don't... <laughs> well, Cyberpunk is... Uh, this is the zombie era, so Cyberpunk is undead. It's undead. <laughs> Sweet. What room is it? And yeah, what room is this? I don't know. <laughs> you shouldn't have one because I love Hammer. Yay! And, uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Hammer, Scar Down, and Roll Scar Down is And, and yours, it's the Archangel Protocol series. Yes. Okay, you can introduce yourself. My name is... Uh, my name is Spencer Kennedy. I'm from Kansas City. Uh, See, I basically throw rakes for a living. Nice. <laughs> that's pretty sad. That's, that's a yeah. fun way to make cool. a living. Uh, my, my anchor in the cyberpunk community is that I was actually a right side hacker in the late 80s and early You're 90s. You're so much cooler than anybody else here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to make you get more intimate sure. with your technology there. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I did there? Yes. Uh, I was a light side hacker in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, I, my specialty was freaking, and that's using oh frequency God, for making awesome. free phone calls and stuff like that overseas. Uh, when uh, the internet really shot up in 95, I kind of got out of it because it, everything just went way over my head. It wasn't really fast. Oh, it, doesn't, it didn't take long in the no. early 90s. Yeah. yeah. So that's about it. So this is like back in the dimness of history when people <laughs> used to whistle tones. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And that's <laughs> freaking. You're, so like, you're like a legend. Can we touch you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Consent is important. <laughs> oh shit! I forgot to ask. Okay, so I, I I said we. Oh, oh good. <laughs> I got permission for both of us. She meant all of you. <laughs> all right. And what else? I lost my voice for Kanye. Yeah. Um, uh, like Elizabeth said, I wrote, uh, and I actually said too, I wrote some cyberpunk novels, that's why I'm here. Uh, right after they told us cyberpunk was dead, I decided that was a good time to start writing cyberpunk. Uh, I wrote... Well, there's a job opening. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> oh, you said they were, we're done with that? Well, I'm just starting. So, so your next book is going to be a vampire western? I, yes. <laughs> with race cars. <laughs> anyway, how are you? Uh, hi, I'm uh, Christopher Pascaret. I'm local. I um, not always been <laughs> local. I was born and raised here, but uh, I my cyberpunk uh, comes from uh, being involved with the role playing game Cyberpunk 2020 by Artel Forians. Uh, I co-wrote and edited the Pacific Rim source book. Uh, I was heading over to Japan and noticed that they didn't really have any materials relating to the area. Oddly enough, being cyberpunk and all, mm. and I said, "Hey, I can write about Japan. I'm going to be there." They said, "Okay," and then a couple of days later, they called back and said, "Okay, well, we have some Japanese guys who can write Japan. Can you write the rest of the rim?" <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I got to research and write about uh, Korea all the way through down to. Uh, to Indonesia from a uh, cyberpunk point of view uh, back in the day. Nice. Are you sweet? Okay, so, so I've got a question for the audience. The, the panel description here is Cyberpunk 101. Is there, looking, looking around the room, is there anybody here who isn't actually already competent in Cyberpunk 101? Is there anybody here who's never heard of Cyberpunk? Of it, but I mean, we should give yeah, a little bit of it. Yeah, okay, you yeah. get to define it. You, you just, <laughs> congratulations, Lottie, you just volunteered. Yeah, well, otherwise, I'd have a Wikipedia. Uh, oh, no, that <laughs> and I'll give you mine, and then you can tell me how I'm wrong. <laughs> that would be really oh, I like that plan. Yeah, um, well, I actually taught a class in cyberpunk. I taught, uh, like, reading cyberpunk at the loft, and one of the ways I, I like to talk about it is, uh, well, cyberpunk has those two words in it. Cyber usually comes from the digitati. Yes, and this, was, right here. this um, was before punk became an affix meaning subgenre. 
Right, <laughs> and actually that is really critical to one of the things I used to talk about is because I guess so cyber can involve any part of, you know, from freaking to, you know, whatever the future may hold for us, virtual reality or whatever in terms of cyber being sort of computer-esque. Or like I said, any digitati, I would think that would count. And the word digitati just means people are into the digital stuff, like the Illuminati. Um, and then the punk part, which like Elizabeth was saying, kind of became uh, an attachment to a genre. Uh, back in the day, particularly we got neur Neuromancer right here, uh, was more about not just the punk movement itself, but also about the underclass in general. And those people seizing control from the man, with their, uh, often with their digital knowledge. And that's that then the arc of the story would you know, turn on somebody who was an insider, outsider, who had the special information. So I mean, that's a little long description, but that's sort of my whole, those are my feelings. I, I, I like to, <laughs> and this is totally <laughs> facile and, and, and a cheap laugh, but I like to define the, the punk movement. I was, I was a little bit of a punk in high school. Uh, this was before, this was while goth was still an adjective. Um, <laughs> there was gothic music. But it hadn't yet been back for him too. There are gods. Uh, punk is sort of like Occupy Aquanet. Yeah. Hey, listen. I used to use glue. What are you talking about? Tony, <laughs> 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 does anybody else want to jump in with another descriptor? Because that was, I mean, I kind of went on, so... Do we... Uh, yeah, the, well, I mean, uh, according to Wikipedia... Oh, that's what I wanted. Thank you. That's why I... <laughs> of course, we're going right back to... Let, let's check out our digital resources on... And what open we're source. Digital. Yeah. Um, cyberpunk subgenre of science fiction in a near-future setting, noted for its focus on high-tech and low-life. It features advanced science such as information technology and cybernetics, coupled with a degree of breakdown or radical change in the social order. You know, the anarchy in the UK plus, you know, computer fun, <laughs> cyber song. <laughs> well, let's see, for me, uh, cyberpunk was more of a philosophy than anything. Um, it was all about just, for me at least, it was all about the, uh, the freedom of information. I mean, if, if the technology was out there to pass information around, then Basically, it should be free. I shouldn't have to pay, you know, nine ninety five or ninety nine cents a minute for access to stuff that every man should have. Um, the exchange of ideas and information, and uh, you know, like medical technologies and stuff like that, should be available to every person on the planet and not held behind walls of protection and. And bread tape and encryption, you know, and, and sold off to the highest bidder and the rest of everybody else is just SOL. Um, for us back then, it was just stealing as much as we can and giving, giving to, the, to our fellow man. And, uh, you know, we, we went around this various ways, you know, either, you know, going to call boxes and clipping in and using uh, corporations' uh, personal uh, phone numbers to call long distances overseas and stuff like that. So in love with you. <laughs> <laughs> we had uh, call boxes, which uh, we had the, uh, the black, the blue, the red, the yellow, and of course all of those had chips in them. And, you know, it's whistling into a phone yeah. pretty much at different frequencies and uh, confusing. I, I, I have one story to tell. Like when we when we realized that the freaking boxes wouldn't work anymore, it was uh, mid '95. I remember we were on a pay phone. And remember course, pay phones? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were, for, for those of you under 20, they were a thing. <laughs> they yeah. still exist. I've seen yeah, them well, in the airport sometimes, but they run on credit cards. So they yeah. do. <laughs> but uh, we were on a pay phone, and of course, you know, it's like we want to dial a, a long distance number, 011, yada, 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 yada. And uh, of course, it's like, please deposit 725 for the first three minutes, put the call box up to it. And nothing happened. And usually it's just right away. It's like do 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 and click connected. And uh, there was a pause for about 30 seconds, and then a live voice on the over the line says, "Now how about you put in some real coins?" Threw <laughs> <laughs> the box down, ran, and, and yeah, and that was about it. So that that was kind of like the uh, the beginning of the end. So, wow. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> I'm gonna write that awesome. yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, right. Let, let it through. Fly on it first. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, I, so <coughs> cyberpunk, I mean, there's a, there's a history to the genre. We talk about Neuromancer, we talk about Snow Crash. There are earlier stories that, that sort of approximate cyberpunk. Um, John Runner's Stand on Zanzibar, uh, which is postulates a, a sort of grim corporate fascist dystopia, much like the cyberpunk one, much like the one we actually got. <laughs> I mean, this may be the problem with talking about cyberpunk today, is we do, did sort of get a grim corporate fascist yeah. dystopia. Yeah. Um, and, and only ours is hotter. And, and, and it turns out that it wasn't, uh, you know, the, the sort of xenophobic Japanese takeover. Um, the, uh, but uh, homegrown evil corporations. Turns out we can grow our own. We don't need to blame somebody else. Um, and, and I'm wondering if we want to talk a little bit about the, the roots of that. Like, mm -hmm. you worked on Cyberpunk 2020. Yeah. Let's talk about that and, and what the sources of inspiration were and uh, how Cyberpunk 2020 served as an entry for a lot of people into the subgenre. Well, with, with Cyberpunk 2020, I mean, I was, a, I was an avid player and had plenty of, of books out before I I jumped on board, but I was I was drawn to it because now this it, was a, a tabletop role playing game. Yep, yeah. which also used to be a thing. Yeah, it <laughs> still is. Um, <laughs> you know, when when I couldn't uh, you know take the, the sword and sorcery anymore and wanted you know more realism, I got into Cyberpunk 2020 with you know actual bullet damages, characters can die, things like that. But you know, it was the 80s when everyone was afraid of the the Japanese takeover. And their, uh, you know, one of their big evil corporations was, of course, Japanese. Um, that's actually one of the reasons why I ended up going to Japan and learning Japanese. <laughs> well, uh, I needed to take foreign language, and my dad said, take something useful, so I took Japanese. Of course, nowadays I would take Chinese. Mm. <laughs> um, but it did bring that, that immediate gritty feeling of uh, you know the, the the Blade Runner, uh, the Blade Runner feel, yeah. to a uh, to a tabletop role playing game. Well, there's there's another cyberpunk forerunner, isn't there? It's the New Android Stream of Electric Trees and, and Blade Runner. Is that that aesthetic of trust yeah. no one? Yeah. yeah. Oh it, yeah, it's uh, well, I mean, all all science fiction for me, unless it's pre, and now I'm still drawing a total blank on the author's name. Gibson? No, uh, for... Uh, oh, oh, Dick? Phil Dick. Yeah, Phil okay. Dick. Yeah. Yeah, anything after Dick traces back to Dick. Philip K. Dick. Somebody just tweeted that just to see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I see tweeting going on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, the, and the elements of film noir, I mean, playing a film noir cyberpunk yeah. game with the cutting edge technology and, and just the extrapolation of, okay, it's, at that point, 30 years from now, what could happen uh, was like the big draw for me. And I'm not sure if I'm answering the question the way you wanted it to. Uh, you were answering the question in an interesting fashion, and I'm, I'm willing to go with that. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, so the, we, we talk about, when we talk about the, the antecedents or the, the earliest exemplars of, of Cyberpunk, you know, the, the Mirror Shades anthology. Mm -hmm. um, and we talk about writers like Gibson and Sterling um, and Neil Stevenson. Uh, I just reread Snow Crash, and my God, you can tell that book was written in the 1980s. This is the problem. It has guys. not dated well. Yeah, well, that, that's a problem with a lot of the cyberpunk yeah. of that time. Neur Neuromancer holds up pretty well. You, you have to assume it's an alternate history. But yeah. Um, but wow, the, the Snow Crash is, is a long string of 80s music videos held together with violence. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean that in a bad way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, and, and it's the same thing. Or impulse control. <laughs> yeah, and that's, a, I think, a, a big problem that people run into with the, the, the whole near future, is that you're going to run up to it pretty quick. Yeah, I mean, yeah. First, there was Cyberpunk 2012. Then they had pushed back to 2020, and now the writer's actually working on a, uh, uh, 
a platform RPG for, I think it's going to be Cyberpunk 2070, but just because 2020 is imminent. Six years from now? <laughs> and, I'm glad you know. <laughs> yeah. I'm so old. And about, about half of the half of the timeline of the from the game, we're only about five years behind. Yeah. I mean we are getting, you know, nearly chipped in uh, prosthetics. Yep. Um, you know, grain based fuels. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not as as uh, widely implemented as we thought they were. Um, uh, neural net communications. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then there are other predictions that just have fallen completely by the wayside. Um, so, you know, like the, the Japanese rise in favor of homegrown uh, corporations. Uh, we're not completely in a, a totalitarian corporate fascist state. Oh, no, we're getting mad. <laughs> <laughs> have you just talked to the Supreme way. Court recently? Yeah. <laughs> Please tell them that. Um, but they, you know, they haven't really completely taken over the functions of government <coughs> that we know. That's because it's uh, cheaper to let government not, not do not it. Overtly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that may be a few years down the line. That's why they had to push it back out to 2070. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they already have the full control. It's just <laughs> the one that they have been as brash. I'm just come out and say it. Yet. Yeah. But there, you know, but there are things that going back even to Philip K. Dick with um, with some of his writings that are now, uh, you know, still completely valid. Um, with uh, the the drug culture mm. uh, and uh, you know his writings on pharmaceuticals. So um, while 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 we're on the topic of, of cyberpunk is predictive, let's talk a little bit about the panopticon state, if you know what I mean by that, the, the surveillance state. <laughs> the Washington. Yeah. <laughs> Does anybody want to jump on that? Um. Well, I mean, ultimately with CCTV, I mean, it's, it's a benefit and a curse at the same time. Um, it puts, places you in, you know, a time, place, and it for, it's forever etched, um, unless you have the ability to either change time or manipulate uh, digital data. Oh, nobody would ever do that. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't know. I, as far as I'm concerned, there are certain places in society that CCTV is, like, required and necessary. Um, but that saying, like, we don't need them at every street sign, you know, street sign, we don't need them, you know, towering over us, like, while we, you know, sit at home, you know, or, like, you know, eating a cheeseburger or something <laughs> like that. We don't need that at all. Uh, I don't know. I just, I, I mean, you know, I'm for the technology. It's just the application that uh, our country and, you know, several other countries across the world use it for, I don't agree with at all. It's, I believe that privacy is a very important thing for any individual, um, you know, because it builds the, you know, you, you have, you know, public time and you have private time, you know. Yes? Uh, who, needs CC, <coughs> or who needs CCTV when you have a, a significant minority of the population voluntarily carrying around a tracking device that broadcasts all the time? You mean like all these? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <Yes. laughs> Especially if you have Facebook, they now have the messenger that pretty much, oh. like, even if it's not on anymore, it's automatically recording visual and audio at all times, which I have not installed on this. Yeah. So. yeah. No, <laughs> the, fir the first thing any of my characters would do is, you know, get a burner phone, rip out the GPS chip. Exactly. <laughs> Start taking some, some precautions. Uh, yeah, when the run-up to the London 2012 Olympics, London already had a lot of CCTV, far more than we do. Most in the world. Probably. And they jacked it up from there, so they're definitely most in the world now. So, you know, being for Vendetta, being yeah, predictive yeah. on, on that count. And, you know, we can even look at, you know, 1984 in that way as a predictive cyberpunk. Um, yeah. And, yeah, we all have the camera, so, you know, who watches the Watchmen because you know, we can videotape the police doing ill, and granted, now they're working on the making that outlawed. Yeah. Um, and if, now, if someone cameras mentioned that, are outlawed, only outlaws will have cameras. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, someone in an earlier panel I was on mentioned that a lot of the police have, you know, the recording right. camera on all the time. You know, granted, they sometimes have malfunctions, or it turns up missing when mm -hmm. things have gone wrong. Uh, I think there's a case in Arizona where you know, a, a, a policeman's camera malfunctioned three times. Each time was when something 
horribly had gone wrong. Uh, yeah. Oh, that would never happen. <laughs> <laughs> they had a thing about the, in London before even the Olympics about the how many criminals they had captured and how many crimes they stopped. And what they had actually captured more than anything else was people making out or having sex in the parks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they had to decide they actually have a time limit of how long they will allow them to make out before they finally send the cop there. But they're like, there is no secret place. So, so what's the time limit? I believe it was 12 minutes. So if you're there for so longer than 12 done, minutes, you're in so yeah. <laughs> yeah, That's why you have to go outside of London to like put me heat. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I think it's interesting that Gibson is no longer writing in the near future. His current novels are all set in the present day. Mm -hmm. And he's spoken about that, how he thinks that that's, it's no longer, the, the things we were talking about have come to pass. Yeah. Um, and I was also thinking about, you know, is cyberpunk relevant today and who's continuing to write it today? And Cory Doctorow mm -hmm. yes. is who I think of immediately. And he write, I just finished Little Brother and Pirate Cinema, and he writes about the surveillance, particularly in London, but in America as well. And it's very much present day or like a year in the future. Yeah. Um, do we, is there anyone writing in the genre that's still going uh, out? Um, uh, Charlie Strauss. Yes. Yeah. I would posit um, Neil Stephenson's yeah, Diamond he, Age as yeah. being more but of a cyber talk post-future. Like, I mean, 15 zone. years old. That's 15 wonderful. years old already. Yeah, I know, but it's you, you look at tribalism that's coming into play. That's yeah. a good but, question. But I mean, the yeah. question is who's writing cyberpunk for, or near yeah. future cyberpunk now? Or what's relevant now is how I approach it. Oh, exactly. yeah. And uh, uh, But Charlie Strauss's, uh, his, his Scottish police procedurals mm -hmm. are, uh, and I can't remember the titles of any of them. Rule 34. And then but there's another one coming out maybe. So he's, no. waiting, he's waiting to find out what the pop, how, Scott, how Scotland votes in the next election before he writes the next one, <laughs> which tells you how, you know, near future projection he's doing. Yeah, and again, we run into that problem of, okay, I've written it and it's already almost out of date. Oh, Unless yeah. we manage to get a really good grip, like yeah. uh, Cryptonomicon. Mm -hmm. Well, well ages very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and Strauss lost four books that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you're absolutely right, Dr. O. And the, the interesting thing about Cory Dr. O, too, is that he, it, he doesn't just limit it to fiction. He also has given that, a fantastic talk called The War on General Purpose Computing, and then follow-up talks where he talks about, you know, the cameras in laptops and smartphones and how the important battle is the software on those devices. Mm -hmm. There was a hand up. You. Oh, I was actually... I was going to say basically what, what you okay. had said. The, the problem is like, in 1990 it was easy to, well, not easy, but it was easier to <laughs> write predictive stuff 30 years out because the technology was moving at a certain pace. We've, we've uh, been doing the, like, I think it's eight, every 18 months doubling again kind of thing for so long now that writing today and trying to figure well, out what's going to happen yeah, 30 years from now. The, the thing that people forget is that Moore's Law isn't actually a law. <laughs> <laughs> It's, well, it's not even that. It's, it's, it's a description of a thing that was happening at a certain point in time, mm. technologically. So anyway, I'm not I'm just going to say, I, I don't know that it's actually any... Uh, how, how do I want to say this? Um, okay, so I wrote my cyberpunk in 1990, and I got almost everything wrong. Um, I'm pretty sure I could still do that today. <laughs> um, so, so what I'm saying is, I don't think... I mean, in some ways, I think people are more afraid of trying to guess, mm. because things went in directions we weren't expecting. But there's absolutely no reason why we can't still guess. I mean, I think people still could guess and still write cyberpunk, but it's interesting to me that we quote sort of happens. And I think part of that is because we are, you know, the punk part is where it's gotten hard. And I think that's the thing that we have to figure out who the hero of the next cyberpunk is going to be. Because if you don't have that hacker who can break in anymore, you know, in the ways that we used to be able to. Right, just the strong samurai and the picture. It's, it's the, like, I mean, you also have to think that there's the motivation to be that hero. That's yeah. right. That's, yeah. A lot of people nowadays are, are more mm -hmm. happy being placated at home in front of the idiot box than right. well, being out there in the streets. Actually. And I'm it's showing you what I ate on Tumblr, so why don't you on you know, <laughs> right. Facebook? So, and, and who needs to hack that? Right. <laughs> yeah, so basically what you're saying is uh, Eric Snowden would be your cyberpunk uh, protagonist. Well, he is. Yeah, yeah, he is a cyberpunk protagonist. Yeah. I mean, that's mm -hmm. perfectly. Um, and I guess Julian Assange would be the cyberpunk anti-hero, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, one of the one of the concepts of cyberpunk has always seemed to me to be that anybody could actually find an exploit because they can't close all the doors. Uh, like the heartbreak uh, thing, it's just mm -hmm. like you know, ask for more digits, mm -hmm. and you, and you get back what you're looking for. Well, you get back a random thing that may include what you're looking for. Yeah. But yeah. Um, okay, so uh, uh, I want I have uh, one more sort of general question, and then I want to move into the discussion of, of some specific properties, if that's okay. Is that okay? Um, no. 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 Okay. Okay. You. So so okay. Specific. General question, very general. Cyberpunk is to science fiction as grimdark is to epic fantasy. Discuss. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. Okay, well, defend. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I oh, maybe it was, uh, I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, maybe we should tell people what grimdark is. Do, does everybody know what grimdark is? No. no. So George Martin. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you die, she dies, everybody dies. That's, that's oh, very simplistic. Oh, you mean Hamlet? But it's, 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 it's quote unquote gritty, realistic, epic fantasy, as opposed to heroic epic fantasy. Oh, it's fantasy. because I thought you meant marketing wise. Because I feel well, like Grimdark had its moment is over, and I thought, well, yes, no, maybe we are at. Yeah. Um, no, I, was, I wasn't thinking marketing wise. I was thinking in terms of subverting a, a, a heroic genre. Oh, yeah. Subverting a previously heroic genre. Because mm -hmm. science fiction up until the 1970s was a very You're talking about the movement now. heroic yeah. genre, right? Yeah. It's, it, it, was, it was white cis het dudes in space. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> with a couple of notable exceptions. <laughs> No, that's absolutely right. And in, in, in which case, then I would say yes. I think that cyberpunk intentionally subverted. In fact, that we know that the early cyberpunk, the movement, as they call themselves, mm -hmm. did in fact intentionally subvert um, what they saw as way too white, uh, way too um, I don't know, a white professional, professional class. I wouldn't say white bread. They purposely went. They wanted to show an underclass. They wanted to show queerness. Um, you know, and, and I don't mean like a lesbian, but I mean like queer, and it's like off mm -hmm. the center. Um, so I guess, I guess, yes. Then I guess I'm changing my answer. I okay, that's experience. fine. There are there. I, I I do not I do not subscribe to false binaries. I mean, it can be yes and no. There you go. Yeah. Uh, I would say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Is that like bees? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you for laughing. <laughs> because. Um, yeah, well, well, both are kind of the, the, the gritty subversion of the style. You know, you know cyberpunk versus, you know, your, your space opera. Um, but science fiction, good science fiction for me has always been um, social commentary dressed up mm -hmm. in, in fancy clothes. And Ooh, that's, cyber, cyberpunk that's really and, and science fiction, you know, still have that social commentary. They just approached it at different, different ways. You know, cyberpunk was more of you know the, the angry young rebels, yeah. as opposed to the armchair theorists of of uh, Frank Herbert and Isaac Asimov. Right. Yeah. Um, and I've 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 felt for a long time that uh, as as a science fiction writer, I felt that. I'm not a futurist. I'm not attempting to predict the future. I'm attempting to illuminate the present day because uh, the people I'm writing for are are you, not future people, uh, not you in 20 years. You know, you right now. Yeah. So cyber, you know, and, and cyberpunk really did that. Uh, you know, they, they they took the, the fears of the day. You know, the, the computers are going to take over. You know, the companies are going to take over. What have you? The Japanese are going to take over, um, and use that to run with their social commentary. Mm. And a lot of Neil Stevenson's you know, later works dealt more issue specific in that range with, you know, with um, Cryptonomicon and, uh, and Snow Crash and some of the others, Diamond Age. Um, where the gritty, you know, dark gritty and, and high fantasy does it necessarily have that social commentary aspect in my mind? I think a lot of it actually does. So, but I think that's a different. That's an argument for a different panel. Yeah. So that's why I say yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ultimately, he pretty much said what I was going to say. So okay. thank you for that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> what, if, what about the, I mean, one of the things that stands out in my mind is the difference between Grimdark and Cyberpunk is that Grimdark doesn't suffer from the time dilation problem, where in 1950, 2000 was the future, and in 1970, 2000 was the future, and in 1990, 2000 was the future, and now, where's the future? Whereas, right. Right. Yeah, sword and sword, yeah. armor and armor. It's kind of although, timeless. Although fantasy suffers from the opposite problem. Fantasy suffers from the, the unrealistic eternal now. Right. Yeah. For, for a thousand years, we have been stuck at this 11th century technolo technological level. <laughs> because reasons. Yeah, but we <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's, that's not that far-fetched. I mean, societies, societies have abandoned technology throughout history. It's that's been true. It's an attempt to yes. consolidate power or any number of others. Yeah, but, but show me one society that has spent a thousand years at the same technological and sociological level. China, after they abandoned exploration. There were still technological advances, however. They, they threw away gunpowder. Europeans showed up and but they, oh, yeah, away gunpowder. They used it for different things. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, specific properties, specific cyberpunk stories. They've, they've got a little list here, but I don't want to talk about the Matrix because. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Because yeah, I, like I will have very unpopular opinions. Oh. Oh. No, no. Well, there was only one Matrix. There was only one movie. There was. There was a real pity about that plane crash that killed everybody involved in the Matrix movies. Yeah. <laughs> very similar to the one that got Metallica in 1993. <laughs> 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 yeah, there are rumors of a second and third Matrix movie, but that's just, you know, okay, it's... What if Kitty goes to the same movie? It's all two and three, it's a... Uh, uh, yeah, we're yeah. <laughs> But, okay, well, I'm going to jump into the Matrix, because yes, I'm kind of curious. Yes, talk about the Matrix. Uh, <laughs> but I actually thought that was um, a very good, you know, more recent... Uh, you know, version it felt like the Wachowskis actually kind of tapped into that um, that zeitgeist again, and you know, updated it um, from you know, not only just in the the technology aspect, but the the fears of the day, um, and then you know went with it very well. And like I said, I, I there's only one movie that I would like. To <laughs> so, I'm I, I, don't, I, I believe I can, I can get an amen. Well, <laughs> one movie and then an animated you know, number of animated True, movies. true, yeah. true. And then there's the animated. Uh, the Matrix seemed like you're kind of the downfall of new cyberpunk stories. You, you really they didn't come up as much hmm. after that. Yeah, and it's really interesting that the project that uh, Keanu Reeves did right before that was an attempt to do um, one of the one of the short stories with uh, Johnny. Oh uh, yeah, there was the Johnny. Oh. Oh. I, there was no Johnny. Oh So we can actually blame Keanu Reeves for killing. We can blame him for a lot of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's managed to be in the, the best, you know, one of the best and the worst. Yeah, all in like the years. <laughs> also the um. Uh, and actually, another good one I would say would be, and it's not so much cyber um maybe, um, but District 9 District Nine mm -hmm. was really good. Granted, you know, they're dealing with aliens, but still the, social. The, the, the social issues were there. And that, for me, that, that social issue. What about Elysium? Would you count that as a cyberpunkish? Um, yeah. Yeah. In, in the in the in the sort of Walter John Williams hardwired tradition. Yeah, yeah right. well, hardwired it's actually, basically it's hardwired as a movie. Yeah, yeah. you know. Movie. What about? Uh, I, ho I hope he got some money out of them. What about uh, Akira? Oh, I love the hero. Uh, yeah. Either the graphic novel or the movie. Mm -hmm. It discusses. Yeah. yeah, and just uh, I, was, I, was, I was traumatized by the initial dub, though. Oh, that initial dub of the hero was horrible. I'm kind of, along this line, I'm kind of wondering if if you would consider Hunger Games to be almost a, a combination of cyberpunk and steam uh, steampunk. Mm -hmm. Well, it has like, cyberpunk attitudes. I mean, but also like like I mean, so much of the, the cyberpunk, the dystopian has been integrated into mainstream science fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Paolo Bacigalupi's The Wind Up Girl would have been a cyberpunk novel 20 years ago, and now it's a mainstream science fiction novel. 
Um, so the legacy of science of, of, of cyberpunk is the dystopia? Among other things. I, and, and I think the, right. well, and the idea of, 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 but so much of what was cyberpunk, right, is real life. You know, constant access to a global, if, if, if as, as Cory Doctorow says, if only we had a global information network at our very fingertips, we could answer that question. Um, you know, it's, it's, some of the cooler stuff about cyberpunk is our everyday technology. Also, some of the scarier stuff about cyberpunk is our everyday technology. So, but, so I think the thing we have left is, is the dystopia. Mm -hmm. And I think in that case, you know, that, that part of the Hunger Games definitely is, does have that sort of cyberpunk, the corporations and the government are out to get you feel. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Start with you. Um, I was going to uh, ask uh, how you felt about uh, the girl with the dragon tattoo as an example of the cyberpunk genre despite not necessarily having the sci-fi elements that we typically associate with it. Yeah, but if it had been written in 1980, it would have been. It would have been perfect, yeah. That's, that's an uh, area in which the, the technology has caught up. Mm -hmm. um, Did you have your hand up? Yeah. I was going to say, when I think the roots of cyberpunk, I always think of Can one you speak that up just a little you bit? haven't mentioned. Uh, Samuel Delaney's yeah. Level 17. I mean, to me, that that's the original cyberpunk novel. Um, I'm going to do this side of the room, and then I'll come over and do you guys, OK? So some, someone I listened to recently that when you were saying about you know, the, the now is a guy named Daniel Surez who wrote Demon. And it's, did anyone else run into that? No. OK. Um, it's set in the point of view of this you know, like head of a gaming company, World of Warcraft, <laughs> um, is kind of what they oh. do. He dies, and all of a sudden, like the, the movie or the book starts out with like two people being killed, and it's he leaves behind an AI, and it ends up changing the entire world. And and you just reminded me of Diane Duane's book Omnitopia, which I don't know if anybody's read, but it's basically um, Microsoft and uh, evil Microsoft and good Apple do battle through, via World of Warcraft. It <laughs> <laughs> made me think of Demolition Man. But the problem oh. yeah. here was, was the fact that he took current technology and went, okay, what can I do with this? I guess my question for you guys, when it comes to the mini cyberpunk for modern people, like in, in the Sh Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., you have kind of a girl who's cyberpunk, but she's been brought into the agents. I mean, she's does that caught. irritate you when it's been kind of a watered-down cyberpunk? I or think it's actually the destruction of the image itself when people like that are integrated into shows. Um, it almost, like, I don't know. That's that's the fate of the counterculture, you know? It's, it's, which it's, it's like punk, though. I mean, you know, punk actually meant something back in the 80s. Nowadays, it's more a fashion trend than anything. Well, when you can find yeah. black makeup at Walgreens, when you used to have to find Right, stuff. you know, you can go down to Hot Topic so and all of a sudden like you're <laughs> cyberpunk. It doesn't really, it doesn't really. <laughs> so you think it waters it down? I, I do. I, I do, at least. It's, it, I think it, it, yeah, it is the fate of the counterculture. Um, the, the counterculture, because this is the thing that, that I, as, as a generation, you know, as a Gen Xer, I'm having, I'm having emotional, emotionally complex responses about as I, as I move into my mid-40s is the realization that I'm the man now. Oh. I'm not, yeah, I'm not okay with that, but I have to take that responsibility and try to do a better job of it than maybe previous generations did and make space for younger generations instead of pushing them out. Um, in, in trying to be a responsible the man. Um, I, I don't want to be an authority figure, goddammit. I want my black clothes and my spiky jewelry. <laughs> then, then I probably should have mentioned that in my mid-40s. I've now become a web developer for Hennepin County. <laughs> <laughs> I am the man. You are the man. You know, but that's... A, Sometimes it helps Some, to hack from the inside. You know? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's got to be the man. It might as well be me. And, and, and thank you for saying that. Sometimes it helps to hack from the inside. Because yeah. that's actually how I see Sky in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Because Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is more of that hopeful science fiction. Um, so yeah. having you know the, the hacker on with the white hat, the white hat hacker. Um, I feel it, it, it doesn't really reflect so much in the cyberpunk because it's 
it's, it's modern science fiction, but it, it's hopeful. Um, you, then you, then you. How's that? Okay. Um, the uh, Ready Player One, would you say that's like, is that just sort of a sci-fi near future? I feel like that's a, a really, and, and this doesn't leave this room. Um, <laughs> I, I, I kind of feel like Ready Player One is a really clever marketing gimmick, wearing cyberpunk as a as a cloak, <laughs> um, and it's a it's a really clever marketing gimmick aimed squarely at my demographic, so I can't bitch too much. Because one of the things I enjoy about being the man is like going to TGA Fridays and they're playing my music. <laughs> The, Be the Beach Boys sort of faded out about five years ago, did you notice? Yeah. <laughs> the downside is that our music is now holding station. Oh, oh, am I in an elevator here? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like uh, you're, you're in the grocery store and they're playing K music versions of KMFDM and you're like, what happened to me? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Anyone? I was actually um, told just what to bring up Ready Player One. That was one of the examples that I had. and then. You and someone else had examples earlier um, that also featured the book with like a huge, like world dominating MMO in which people do battle or people fight corporations or people fight the government because the whole world is built around this one huge game that dominates everything. And there are a couple other books that are like that too. Um, Epic was a good uh, young adult book that had that. And I was wondering, do you think that's like a really either like a really integral part of cyberpunk or like a subgenre of cyberpunk or what, what's your opinion on that whole? That's a really interesting question. Well, I, I think with the young adult dystopian novels that we're seeing come out, I mean, it, again, science fiction tends to be cyclical and the young adult market now is where, again, you have, you have the, angry, the angry young rebels who are really good at technology um, you know, it used to be that we had to help our parents program the VCR, and now those of, of our age who have kids, we might need our kids to help us, you know, set up our Facebook. <laughs> so the, the cycle has come around again, and I think definitely they're tracking with the age. And so, yeah, young adult is where cyberpunk is re-emerging. Re it might be in a slightly different uniform. Are you also asking if gaming is going to be part of the new cyberpunk model? Is that part of your question too, or your thought? That, yeah. Yeah, that I guess I think you're right. right. What? Well, it almost has been. No, it, you, you actually just made me think of something interesting, because there's some, um, uh, there's, there is a, uh, a, a like sub-genre sub of cyberpunk, punk, <laughs> sorry, fourth panel today. Um, <laughs> There's a subgenre of, of cyberpunk where it's the, the everything you think you know is illusion. It's it's sort of the Truman Show, you know, yeah. um, where the entire it, which has this weird like solipsistic thing going on. But anyway, that's a different panel. Um, so I, I think the short answer is yes. Bees. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. it, no, behind you. Um, I, I get, I'm still, I'm kind of new to cyberpunk as a genre, so I'm not sure if this qualifies, but Continuum, the TV show, where the hero works for the establishment, at least where they are um, currently, but the villains are the ones that are rebelling against the corrupt government. Does this still make it a valid cyberpunk in that you're cheering, or I mean, essentially you're kind of cheering for, or supposed to at least want the hero? I think with Continuum, it's more like the, the entertainment value is, is that you don't know which side to root for with that. Um, I don't know. I don't know how many people in the room have actually seen the show. I mean, it's, you know, when you when you have the fate of the world at your fingertips, almost like magic, you know, that that power corrupts no matter what. It doesn't matter if you're good or bad. You know, just as long as if you're holding that information back. Or using it for something other than helping everyone else besides yourself. It's going to be evil. At least that's the way I see it. So You just made me think of something really interesting. Because we're talking about uh, where cyberpunk might go at some point. And you just hit something really fascinating to me, which is the idea that it's so much harder now 
to isolate the villain, just yeah. in general. Yeah. And you know, in a, in a lot of early cyberpunk, it was very clear it's going to be the corporations. Right. You know, and now of course we, why is that's all? It's come become a lot more murky. And I think that's uh, maybe one of the reasons why cyberpunk is sort of why we're having a hard time naming newer ones. Right. Because you know, the punk part. It's hard to figure out who are we rooting for, right. you know, and that's really fascinating. Because, so it's, well, to add on to that too, it's uh, you know our heroes are now all anti-heroes. Yes, they are. These, pe are these people go out and actively hurt innocent people to get it's it's a uh, what like Star Trek, right? The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the one, <laughs> right? So you know you have your hero going out and offing like a whole family just to accomplish one goal, and I mean you can still view that person as a hero you know, at the end of the line, mm -hmm. but I mean, at that point, you're still committing evil. There's, I mean, you still have the answer for it, so. Well, and there's, there's the, the issue there that, that science fiction or, or narrative in general is not necessarily didactic. You know, just because I am showing somebody doing crappy things does not mean that I think you should go out and do crappy things. Possibly it means that I think you should think about the crappy things this person is doing and try to get around accommodation with them. I was also thinking about your idea about young adult stuff in the words behind it. And, and how I'm thinking about Hunger Games, because that was brought up before. The interesting thing about the revolution in that one is it doesn't entirely work. Right. You know, the ending is actually quite dark. Yeah. Um, well, they're, they're really surprisingly socially subtle and, and but it's, nuanced books. It, they actually really are surprising and surprising. But <laughs> I, I actually loved all three. Um, although I was disappointed in the ending because I'm still enough of a cyberpunk a fan that I wanted to end up on the other side of that in a better place, not just at sort of a meh, this will do. <laughs> Which is it's interesting because I wonder if the next generation is going to be more meh, this will do, because that might be in some ways the best outcome. <laughs> There was a, a panel I was on yesterday, and I can't remember which one, because yesterday was also a four-panel day, um, where we were discussing sort of the differ differentiation between baby boomer science fiction and Gen X science fiction. Baby boomer science fiction, baby boomers believe stuff can be fixed. Gen X is like, maybe we can kick the can down the road without fucking it up too badly for the next group. <laughs> 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 you know, and millennials will be like, fuck this. Yeah. 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 We're, we're, we're going to We're out of here. We're out of here. Hey, that's a solution. Yeah. You've been very patient. Uh, I was thinking like along those lines, maybe Ender's Game, because of the whole way that whole thing turned out. Like where you have just, they don't really know everything what's going on until the end. And maybe like it puts into that question of, are we doing some? Are we doing like a benefit for all society, or are we committing some kind of like ultimate sin? Yeah. yeah, I think Ender's Game plugs a little more neatly into the. Um, well, I don't think it's really cyberpunk. But yeah, I think into, into the military those, science you know, fiction conversation that includes yeah. um, Starship Troopers and Forever War. Yeah. And you know, it, and and Forever War has sort of a similar twist at the end, which I won't spoil. Um, I spoiled it yesterday. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, there there is there is a similar there is a parallel conversation going on in military science fiction in like the the pre-Vietnam generation versus the Vietnam generation versus the Iraq War generation, and and how war is viewed. Um. Um, okay, so you mentioned about like uh, video games as part of cyberpunk kind of thing, and. Um, like like Neuromancer has the diving in thing and yeah. uh, Sha uh, Snow Crash has the, the goggles and stuff. We've got Oculus Rift now. Do you think that is the result of Cyberpunk? Oh heck yeah! Oh, and do you think that the uh, like is like is it going to help re re bring up more Cyberpunk stuff with with the technology? The technology. Or is it just going to be like? Oh sure. Well, I mean, the the thing is that uh, the, 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 the the Cyberpunk idea of, of virtual reality is at this point so thoroughly integrated into mainstream science fiction. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, high, it's not just, high, yeah, whatever. I was going to say, it's not just even science fiction. You watch CSI, and they yeah. have things that, that don't yeah. exist, and you're like, wow. Um, that's like, so uh, uh, <laughs> Ryan Emmy's uh, Quantum Thief, Fractal Prince, they're not cyberpunk books. They're not marketed as cyberpunk books, but they're totally about virtual reality. Uh, I have a, a story out two years ago now uh, in the house of Ariana in the Lonely Signal Burns that takes, I have several stories set in this, this future 
where there's a whole bunch of like ability to skin reality and filter out stuff you don't want to see, or if you have set your privacy settings the right way to filter yourself out of other people's reality. Um, they give you privacy settings? <laughs> <laughs> this is Very fiction. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not saying that the people running the computers can't see through yeah. them, but the other users see them as invisible. <laughs> um, the, uh, I don't think Trillion thinks I'm invisible when I'm, you know, logged in as invisible, or, or AIM, or whatever the hell, you know, instant messenger you're using, but your ex-boyfriend can't see you. So <laughs> AOL knows you're there, but the... Uh, Oh, there's a dystopia. AOL <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, is a dystopia. AOL is a dystopia. A blasted dystopia at this point. So, so I think it's it, it's it's virtual reality is no longer a cyberpunk thing. It's just a science fiction thing. I guess um, we haven't I haven't heard from you yet. Yeah, um, the virtual reality just sort of struck me because the company that I work we have a technology where could you so, yell a little bit? Uh, I work for a company where um, we have the technology that we're using. You sit in a room with a couple other people, and it looks like just on the other side of the table are the people from Argentina and Warsaw and Bangalore. It's just like in Captain America, too. Yeah, right. It's super this, cool. <laughs> this, sort of, this comes up with my question about who's writing about the way that you, we, we talk about companies or corporations and governments, but it's sort of like the governments are, um, the companies outsource stuff for the governments to take care of. And companies that may have started, like outside Chicago, uh, move to the Bahamas first, and then with the changing of the tax laws, decide that they're moving to Ireland, and they have a French CEO, and I find myself working on a team that is in Warsaw, Madrid, Frankfurt, Buenos Aires, mm -hmm. Manila, and it's, you know, it, it isn't like one company anymore. And we're interacting even with the companies that are supposedly our competitors. It's, and the people that make the decisions, there's a very few people that make the decisions at the top of the thing. And I'm wondering if there's anybody writing about that. Strauss. Charlie Strauss. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's a fast answer. Yeah, the, um, and I've kind of, I was thinking along those lines with one of the other questions that uh, came up about uh, just the whole moral gray zone that we're in now um, uh, in the rapid globalization. Um, you know, if I were writing a cyberpunk novel right now, my protagonist, hero, anti-hero, whatever, you know, would be a, a WHO protester. Or not WHO, um, uh, World World Bank protester. No, oh, right. The World Bank is so scary. Yeah. Oh. You know, the World what, Bank is a cyberpunk dystopia. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually why I dropped out of political science right there. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, you know the the, the, the protesters at the uh, the G8 summit, um, you know, would be classic classic cyberpunk esque protagonist. Even though those, uh, you know, those, those organizations might be doing good, the same with you know, like a GMO protester. Even though yeah. the GMOs might be feeding millions of Africans who would otherwise starve, from his viewpoint, it's it's a corporate evil. Well, and the, 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 the I mean, my, my joke about you know Occupy Occupy Aquanet, the, the Occupy movement is is a very cyberpunk movement. Yes. Um, there were there was a hand up over here from somebody who hadn't been hadn't had a chance to speak and I can't remember who you were. That was probably uh, me, but my question was taken. So okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, then you, and then we'll come back to the people who've already had a chance. Is that okay? Yeah, I'm not sure if you, any of you have played the game, but there's a game Netrunner. Um, it came out in the mid-90s. It was made by Richard Garfield, the game named Magic. And it was competing with Magic and died, but um, recently another company, Fantasy Play Games, uh, purchased it and they're kind of re reliving it in their own setting they made, uh, sci-fi setting. Um, but what's interesting is that in the 90s version, it feels very much in line with those movies, or the books, I mean, where you're um, you know, fighting the system and everything's really grimy and, and whatnot, but the Android setting is, is much more clean, but it's still like them fighting the system. So everyone has really, you know, kind of nice clothes and you have very fancy glow screens and whatnot, but you're fighting the corporate entity. You have the runner against the corporation 
and you're hacking in in order to exploit their, their weaknesses and whatnot. But that, yeah. It's actually based on uh, that RPG original Netflix. Yeah, the first world has remained amazingly clean compared to uh, what the predictions were going to be. <laughs> Well, you touch on um, Wind Up Girl and mm -hmm. the issue with the GMO stuff. So, has the big fear that initiated and blossomed cyberpunk so well been completely replaced by the fear of GMO technology and stem cell manipulation, things like that? There are actual banned um, substances in, uh, in Europe that are accepted here in America where we're so polluted uh, with things. So, is cyberpunk really just not not that relevant anymore. It's not the big fear. It doesn't have the, the fear element that um, has been replaced by other yeah. things, like, like, you know, what they do to us genetically. Yeah, I, the, the short answer is yes. Um, the, the science fiction of any given era reflects the social anxieties of that era. So in the 1960s, 1970s, you get a whole bunch of overpopulation science fiction. In the 1980s, you get a whole bunch of um, computer dehumanizing computer technology and corporation science fiction. Uh, there was a whole bunch of, of singularity and AI science fiction. There was oh, there also the 80s had the nuclear post post apocalyptic nuclear war thing, and now we're really concerned about global warming, GMOs, you know, and zombies, yeah. zombies, <laughs> zombies, <laughs> genetic engineering. Um, Some of which are genetically engineered. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, 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 there's Sean and the virus are genetically yeah. engineered. Um, so yes, basically. Does anybody else want to jump on that? Um, I would agree. Anybody else want to jump on the genetic engineering? <laughs> Yay, genetic engineering. I want a tail. Oh. <laughs> Could you call that biopunk? Yeah, well, punk punk has become a, a as I said, an ethics yeah. meaning subgenre. There's bug punk, bio punk, cypher punk, you name it. There's punk punk about it. So yes, bio punk is a term that gets used. I like bug punk, which is what Cameron Hurley says she writes. Uh. But uh, yeah, I was gonna actually uh, tack on to that of the, uh, you know, it's the, the social fear of the day, um, you know, in the, in the 80s, uh, you know, both, both here and in England, you know, that's when our, you know, Cyberpunk came out, that's when V for Vendetta, uh, you know, came out, uh, you know, which were feared for the overarching uh, fascist state. Yeah, I don't know why anybody in the UK would have been concerned about fascism in the 1980s. No. Yeah. <laughs> or here, actually. <laughs> yeah. So, and that, you know, and that, I think, is sometimes an element that gets forgotten, is, you know, the, the political aspect. Because if you go back to 1984, um, which is, you know, proto-cyberpunk in, in, in my view, um, you know, there was the overarching communist state because it was the times, it was anti-Soviet. And one of the things I wrote about in Archangel Protocol is that the thing I was afraid of during the Reagan era was that uh, the religious right would take over. See again, how am I going to write that now? Yeah, well, that's kind of, I did a whole bunch of that in the, the Jenny Casey books, too. Mm -hmm. and, well, well too late. Oh. Yeah. At least we got in ahead of the, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and granted, this also bleeds over into, you know, straight up dystopia, like um, Handmaid's Tale. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly right. <laughs> uh, way in the back with the beard. What did you think of Max Andrew in the TV series? Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I also want to put out a shout out for, for my favorite um, or favorite science fiction movie, Strange Days. Yes. The highly underrated Strange the Days. Sweet yeah. Technology. Oh, yeah. That was yeah. so oh, wonderful. I know. And and the thing that I love most about it as a as a tabletop gaming nerd is that the end of the movie entirely hinges upon setting the solo and the fixer to do each other's jobs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Send the fixer to get into a fight and the solo to explain something to somebody. Yeah. And, and the dice are not gonna help you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and it's it's always fun to get those ones that are you know, outside of the genre, but echo it a bit. Um, you know, for me, Leverage was a oh, great yeah. TV show that... Le Leverage that, is a really cyberpunk TV yeah. show. Yeah, and, you know, because they were they were criminals who were, you know, using their powers for good and having to and they fight had, against the corporate... They were specifically going up against corporations, which... Yep. And they had the best technology. 
Yes. Oh, God, yes. What about it's, the person of interest? Wasn't that the one yeah. where they used the... Actually, that's, that's a thing that's been... That, that I just realized something. Um, these are the best panels. It's the one where I have an epiphany. Um, the thing that's been, that been stripped off of stuff like leverage is the, the 80s, you know, live fast, die young, leave a good looking corpse thing. It's, it's actually the zeitgeist of the 80s, which was part of the cyberpunk aesthetic, right? Um, live fast, die young, leave a highly augmented corpse. <laughs> and, and now it's more like, well, really, we'd like to live to retirement age and still sock it to the man. <laughs> There's a, but, but the, I don't know if you can still call it cyberpunk when that, without that particular bit of the aesthetic. Well, it, I think that's, like I said, re-emerging in the young adult with YOLO. Yeah. The only living, so, yeah. as much as I hate that, that. Yeah, but they'll, they'll turn 30 and things will start to hurt. <laughs> it's, it's that morning when you wake up and your back's like oh. yeah my whole attitude changed uh, right around 30 <laughs> so your first hangover man yeah. um, you had something to say and then I think we're done oh uh, we were talking about the sort of millennial take on cyberpunk and you know the whole fuck it yeah. Have any of you guys listened to the Metropolis audiobooks that were put together by John Scalzi? And she wrote one of the stories. You wrote one of them. <laughs> three, three of the stories, actually. But that's, that's the approach I see the millennial generation taking. Uh, screw you, we're taking our toys and doing something different. Mm -hmm. And so then you get to Skadiopolis, where basically we're living in a mountain and genetically engineering bacteria to grow our food. Yeah, it, it was well, Metropolis, for those of you who, who don't know about it, was an audiobook series, three books. Uh, the first one uh, edited by John Scalzi, two and three edited by the late great Jay Lake, mm. um, which is why there probably won't be a number four. Mm. But uh, which are were our intent was to talk about alternative futures um, and ways to use technology to uh, basically to to maintain as much personal and intellectual freedom as possible in a in a potentially corporate world and or post uh, post crash post peak oil post ecological catastrophe future like how can you still have a sustainable society in a world where you know the worst that we can imagine right now has already happened um, they are they are available through audible what is the name again metatropolis awesome. they're absolutely fantastic Thank you. And the first set was narrated by BSG cast members, and the second was narrated by Star Trek cast members. You haven't lived nice. until you've heard mm -hmm. René Avangelois read a cyberpunk dystopian story. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys are free to go eat <laughs> or use the bathroom. Thank you.